So I would like to, or we would like to uh, thank the conference organizers for giving us the opportunity here to speak our, about our event builder, the CMS experiment at CERN. Um, this works. No. Okay. So the outline of the talk is: uh, we first say a few things about the compact muon solenoid experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, how we go from collisions to observations. Um, I will say a few things about what is event building. This is the, uh, I mean, what I'm discussing here in the talk. Um, then we'll talk about the event builder upgrade, about the choices of technologies we made, um, the first layer of the event builder, then the some words about the performance tuning we had to do, um, talk about the second layer, and then present some uh, performance measurements, then a uh, few words about the high-level trigger, and uh, then the summary. Okay. Yes. Okay, so what is it what you're doing? Um, this is, uh, yes, in a nutshell, um, this is a history of the universe. You see, does this work here? Uh, I have to push. Yes, okay. So you have the Big Bang on the left side about 30 billion years ago. You have a phase of inflation. And uh, at the beginning, the universe, universe was very hot. It was a soup of all kinds of particles flowing around. Then as time evolves, the universe cools down, so things start to condensate. Um, the, the quarks, for example, they start to form protons and neutrons. Then at some point, also the temperature becomes lower so that the protons and neutrons form actual nuclei. And uh, then uh, things, so if you do nuclei, and then at some point things cool even more down, then so that uh, the nuclei start to attract the electrons, the electrons will stay, so you start to have atoms. Then at some point also the atoms, our temperature decreases again, um, so that even the atoms start to cluster, you have stars and galaxies forming and so on, and this is where we are today. So what we do actually is we go back in time. So we want to create in the laboratory um, situations, I mean, the, yeah, we want to reproduce the situations like it was early after the Big Bang. Um, so, yes, the, uh, this presentation, right, if this works, actually, yes, sorry. This presentation is about, uh, yes, there, what you see there. Um, okay, it's a bit unfortunate. Um, yes. So this is what this presentation is about. Now, how do we uh, uh, create conditions soon after the Big Bang in the laboratory? Unfortunately, the laboratory is not a single room anymore. You need something larger. Um, what you see here is an aerial view of, uh, here you have the CERN main site in, uh, I mean, this is close to Geneva. This is in Switzerland. The second site here is in, in France. Here you have the, the big accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, with a circumference of about 27 kilometers. Um, you have Western Europe's highest mountain here, the Mont Blanc, the Lake Geneva, and the runway of the airport. Um, we have four major experiments at the accelerator, which are LHCB. I found out that some of the colleagues from LHCB are also here at the conference. Our main competitors, Atlas, then uh, heavy ion experiment, Alice, and our experiment is here, uh, exactly opposite CERN here. It's usually half an hour's drive to go there. Um, yes. Okay, so essentially it's a proton-proton collider. So now we create um, uh, conditions like they were early after, the un uh, early after the Big Bang in the very early universe. Now we have to detect them. So how do we do this? In our case, with a compact muon solenoid. You see how compact it is by looking at the scale here. This is a person. Um, the, the height is about 14 meters. Our competitor's detector is about twice the size in every dimension. It's not because we like to build big things. It's just because of the laws of physics. Um, if you want to have some reasonable resolution, you have to build it uh, big tracking chambers. Um, so what you see, this is the beam pipe as they come in from one side of the detector and from the other side of the detector. This is where the collision is happening. So to detect the things, you have uh, the innermost layers are essentially a 66 million uh, pixel camera, which uh, takes pictures every 25 nanoseconds, about four, so 40 million pictures per second. Then you have another few layers of silicon strip detectors, and this is mainly to detect charged particles. And then this is uh, 
surrounded by two layers of what we call chirometers. These are absorbing detectors. They absorb certain type of particles completely and convert their energy essentially into light, which we then can read out with uh, photosensitive uh, uh, detectors and digitize them and, uh, if needed, store for offline processing. Um, then we have a 3.8 Tesla magnet here. And outside what we call muon chambers, because the only particles, or the only visible particles which go to these are muons. This is uh, also the same particles as we have in the cosmic rays, which are going through us all the time. <coughs> okay, so this is how it looks in real life. Um, you see down here, this is actually from Google Maps. So Google came at some point, and you can see this. You can walk around the detector on your computer. I created a short URL here, so you should be able to walk around the CMS detector. OK, um, let's see if this works. So now we have the collisions, we have the detector, but uh, most of the collisions are actually not interesting, or not interesting anymore. They would have been interesting probably 30, 40 years ago, but now we know them. So the new physics phenomena we look for are typically rare. So this is an example of uh, collisions, of a collision we look for. So you see the detector. Let's see how this works now. Yes, OK. Oops, sorry. This is advancing too fast. Yes, OK. Let's try again. OK, so you see the in blue, I hope you can see them, is the uh, incoming proton bunches, then at some point they collide and they create lots of secondary and tertiary particles and they leave traces in the detector which are visualized here. So you see the, the tracks and also in bold here, if I can stop this at the right time, yes. So you see um, the proton bunches going out after the collision again, you see lots of uh, uh, secondary particles produced, which are low energetic, so they're not too interesting for us, but still we have them. And uh, they, for some, I mean, to some extent, they spoil our performance. I mean, they don't spoil the performance, but we would rather not have them, but it's unavoidable. And then you have here, for example, these four straight tracks here, which are um, particles, which in this case come from, uh, or very likely are from a Higgs particle, which was produced here. So by looking at the energies and the angles of these things, we can then go back and calculate the mass of the original particle was decaying, and then essentially look for if you have an accumulation of these masses somewhere in the spectrum. Okay, so now this is a event building centric view of uh, how this actually works. So you go from, you have a detector here, you have the protons colliding. Um, um, and this is at the rate of typically 32 megahertz. Um, unfortunately, we cannot read out all this data. I mean, I guess the storage vendors would be happy if you want to buy such a system. Um, but we also would need the CPU power, so this is, uh, this is unfeasible. So what's happening is that we read out some, I mean, every 25 nanoseconds, we have some summary data which comes out of the detector, which is indicated here. And this typically goes into a custom electronics, which is built from FPGAs. Everything is synchronous here. And uh, we make a first selection so that uh, from this, uh, every 25 nanoseconds corresponding to 40 megahertz, we can read out about uh, 100 kilohertz. So this is logic here, which decides this. Um, once the signal is sent here, so there's a lot of electronics on the detector, including memories, and of course you want to keep uh, this memory as small as possible because it's expensive, it has to be radiation hard and so on. Um, you send a signal to these memories um, to actually read out an event. So in the new design, we have to account for about two megabytes per collision, and this at the 100 kilohertz rate. This again goes then into FPGAs, um, and at this point, we want, obviously, we want to go to commercial technology as soon as possible because then we can buy the things rather than having to develop them ourselves. Um, and in the new system, we then go from the FPGA to 10 gigabit Ethernet. This then goes into uh, an aggregation layer of switches where we go from 10 to 40 gigabit Ethernet. We have a first uh, stage of uh, PCs which do some partial aggregation of the data of certain regions. Um, this goes then through a fully connected InfiniBand FDR network where they go into second stage of aggregation. I mean, this is sort of, it's, um, it's like a barrier. You have to wait until all the data is here and then you can send the data out. So at this stage here, you have the full collision data assembled and then you distribute it again uh, from 40 to 10 gigabit to uh, a form of uh, what we call higher level trigger where we have another reduction from the 100 kilohertz to about 1,000 collisions per second, which then goes to um, an intermediate storage and then to offline storage. 
Um, it's also replicated. Um, some of the data sets go to the grid. Also, we need a lot of simulation. We simulate the known physics processes. Um, and uh, the detector, obviously, and this is lots of the simulation is actually stored outside CERN. So in these PCs, this is uh, an art by itself here. So people design their classifiers to separate the uh, new physics phenomena we look for um, from the known background. So you have uh, simple selections up to boosted decision trees here and so on. So. And then in the end, you have a, an offline selection. And what you do is, in this case, you look at an accumulation in the mass spectrum here. So you would have here the mass spectrum of uh, such collisions. You see, this is uh, as data was coming in over 2011 and 2012. You see you have this uh, unknown processes building up here. But also then you see here, for example, um, that a new particle is detected in this case was uh, the Higgs particle. Okay, so some words about offline uh, storage. I call it offline. I mean, yeah, it's probably not called offline computing grid, but it's the LHC computing grid. The reason I call it offline is not time critical. Everything in the event builder has is time critical. Um, you don't want to waste accelerator time. It's very expensive, and you don't want to lose time with respect to our competitors, um, because then the more data you have, the more precise your statistical accuracy is. So, another question. Okay. Um, so this is a list of the LHC computing grid sites. So it's really uh, from Australia to to the US. Lots of sites in Europe, obviously, but also, for example, in Japan and Brazil. Um, just to zoom in here, this is where CERN is, that's the tier uh, zero. Uh, this is here in Mano, essentially. Uh, I, I believe the fiber goes a bit the more direct way than the train from Geneva to Lugano. Okay, so now event building in a nutshell. I have uh, shown here, I have a picture of the CMS detector. So this is just to indicate there's different parts of the detector um, which produce data, which are stored in some... Uh, buffers here essentially and the uh, this uh, corresponds to what we call fragments this is pieces of inform uh, pieces of uh, data typically about two to four kilobytes or so each um, which are then uh, assembled so uh, this is just a view of how this works so you have a first layer of aggregation here which uh, a first layer of aggregation here, then you go through the full switching matrix and you have the full event building on the second layer here. This is another example here. So you see data doesn't necessarily come at the same time over all the links, so you have to make sure you synchronize as well. Uh, yes, even more so. Things are also pipelined. Um, obviously, we don't have to wait for the first event to be fully built before the next can be sent and so on. Okay. Sorry. Yes, so, yes, why do we need to upgrade? Um, many pieces of the equipment in uh, LHC Run 1, they have reached the end of life. You want to have a stable system. You don't want that your PCs fail all the time at 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, as I said, accelerator time is expensive. Um, we will add more detector channels in the next one, two years or so, so you need a higher readout capacity. Um, and then also the accelerator will, will start with a new energy to increase the sensitivity to new physics. Um, this is mainly done by increasing the beam energy, which gives you more or higher multiplicity in the collisions. So there's more physics processes happening per collision. Also, uh, you want to increase, in, or they will increase in intensity and, and beam intensity and focusing, which gives you uh, more collisions. So what is shown here, for example, this is a view of the central part. You have the, this is the beam axis here, so the protons would be uh, coming in here. And then you have, you see per collision, you just, you not only have one interaction, so each yellow dot corresponds to an interaction, and the tracks are coming from these. Um, so clearly we'll get more yellow dots as we uh, increase in beam in intensity. So this is, for example, a graph where you see the number of these yellow dots here, what we call the primary vertices, um, versus the, uh, the, the size of the data coming out of the collision. This was, uh, I think, the average in uh, 2012 or so, but you see it nicely scales linearly with the, uh, how many interactions you actually get per collision and so on. So we need to process, to be able to process a higher data volume per collision. Okay, so uh, one of the new choices we made for this for this upgrade was InfiniBand. So this was we didn't use this before. Um, um, yes, so this is you probably all know this graph of the top 500 
org. This is the fraction of interconnect uh, of the top 500 system. So you see when the, the system for run one, so the old system was designed in 2002, Mirinet was a very popular interconnect. In fact, the, uh, the run one system was, the first layer was uh, based on Mirinet. And, uh, but uh, in 2013, it looks like InfiniBand is a very a useful interconnect, so we gave it a try and we were quite happy with it. We also use a 10 gigabit Ethernet there. Um, this probably I don't have to, you probably also know, but uh, just to remind people that uh, we like it because it was really de designed as a high performance interconnect and not like a robust protocol where you want to send data from the east coast to the west coast of the US and make sure that if somebody blows up your router in the middle that they find an alternative route. Um, it is, what you also like, it's implemented in the, uh, in the silicon of the network card, so you don't have a lot of CPU overhead. Um, just because uh, you have to run the TCP IP protocol, you can have 56 gigabits. Now, I mean, the slide is a bit outdated in the sense that nowadays you can already have 100 gigabits. Um, you have native support for just uh, copying blocks of memory to a remote PC. This is also something you like. And also, there's no copying of bulk data between the user space and the kernel, which happens for the, because of the semantics of the uh, BSD sockets. When you call your write call, the kernel has to make a copy. What happened here? The kernel had to make a copy um, because you're allowed to modify the buffer again. This is not the case here. So, some what we originally thought the disadvantage is less widely known. The API, of course, differs significantly from the BSD sockets API, um, so you have to work a bit harder. It's also, I think, more difficult to implement in an FPJ than TCP/IP. Uh, you have fewer vendors than Ethernet, and it's a bit of a niche market. Okay, so this is the overview of the Run2 event builder. So the data flows, I mean, the tech would be somewhere here, the data flows from the top to the bottom. So you have here the electronic devices which are built by different universities, um, which uh, basically interface to the undetector electronics, and from there we have a standardized link, which is standardized within our experiment, so a copper link, which is very easy to handle um, from the electronic side. We go into our modules here which convert from this uh, from this coupling to 10 gigabit Ethernet. This is still on the ground, so the, the slide is in a sense inverted that the top part is actually 100 meters on the ground. We go over 185 meters of OM3 fibers um, to the top where we have this uh, 10 to 40 gigabit Ethernet switches, the first layer of the uh, event, building PCs, the full connectivity InfiniBand network, and then on the out, here you have the second layer of uh, event building where you have the full uh, collision data aggregated and then distribution switches, which are 40 gigabit Ethernet switches, where we also use split ports to convert to 10 gigabit Ethernet. And here are the PCs which run the second, or um, the higher level selection here in software. Okay, so the first module I was talking about is the where we go from custom to standard protocols. So here you have this copper cable connects. Um, in the future, we'll also have uh, optical inputs here from 6 or even 10 gigabits, but it's a custom protocol which is easy to implement in electronics, so no, no uh, TCP IP or something. This is actually a compact PCI module. And it's made of this card, which was, is a custom design, which we used, we reused from, the, from Run 1. And uh, in Run 1 we had here, instead of this card, which is also newly designed, now we had a Mirinet card, so we have a PCI-X interface here, and we could put in a commercial card here. Um, yes, obviously, so this is the last step where we have to use our own designs, because after we do uh, 10 gigabit I mean, once we have it converted to standard protocols, we can use commercial equipment, so this is very nice. Um, we actually had, years ago we had some discussion, how would we be able to uh, do TCP IP in an FPGA? And uh, the conclusion we had is we need a top class FPGA where we would run the soft processor and the Linux inside to drive 10 uh, gigabits per second until a person joined our group which actually has uh, uh, quite a broad knowledge about FPGAs and also the TCP IP protocol. So basically what he did, he took the, uh, I mean, it looks simple now, but it's quite a bit of work actually. So he took the TCP state diagram here and figured out which states do we not need, so most of the states we don't need for our application, reduced it to essentially these few states. And so then we were uh, able to implement it in the mid-range FPGA. Yes. So this is how these modules look in practice. You see here the, the, the copper connects 
uh, the copper interconnect coming in and here the 10 gigabit fibers going out. Obviously this is just one, uh, one crate of many. This is still on the ground, so then you go 100 meters to the surface. Um, where we have the first layer of the switching network. This is a photo of it, so you see 16 switches here. Um, where we come in with the 10 gigabit lines, we go out to the PCs with the, the 40 gigabit here. So this is indicating the PCs where we have the, this is essentially aggregation layers. You build a partial, you do a partial assembly of the, the collision data for each collision. Um, in principle, we don't need full connectivity here in the future. We are building a factory network here to connect the switches because if the, the PC fails again at 3 o'clock in the morning typically, um, if one fails, it's okay, but if multiple fail, at some point you don't have enough processing capacity on the switch, so you want to be able to connect, to send some of the data to another, to another switch here. So some words about performance tuning. Um, this was also something which was new for us that you cannot just run things out of the box and you get maximum performance. This was the case in run one, but it, these days are gone, I think. Um, so we had to, be, to do careful tuning of, I mean, this is a diagram of uh, how, uh, I mean, a schematic diagram of the first layer PCs, um, so you have the 40 gigabit Ethernet card here, you have to do C uh, the two CPUs with their local memory, it's a new architecture, and uh, you have the InfiniBand output here, so we had to do some careful tuning of the, uh, the receive queue interrupts, so you don't want to, you want to be in control of uh, which interrupts go to which core, and we, we did some extensive tuning to see what gives us best performance. Um, we had to play a little bit with the TCP kernel settings, the standard distribution comes with, I think, with a socket buffer size of a few hundred kilobytes, which is clearly not enough. Um, also the software, the software threads, we uh, had to carefully assign them to which core are they running on, on the input side or on the output side, for example. Uh, yes, also you have to do, be careful where you allocate your memory, so that, for example, you don't allocate the memory for the input buffer here, and so on. So. so this is probably what we would call the core of the event builder network. So this is a, a folded clone network uh, built from uh, 12 leaf and six spine switches with uh, 36 port FDR switches. We have between each uh, leaf and spine, we have uh, three links. So this means we have uh, 216 external ports where the uh, when you look at, I mean, when you take the 108 ports times the link speed, you get to about six terabits per second. Um, for the moment, we run the subnet manager on a switch. Um, we needed, f we need really full connectivity here because, as I said, each second layer of um, PC has to ac has to have access to or has to see all the. Uh, uh, all the different sources of uh, detector data because it has to build a full event. Um, one of the reasons why we had have this discrete versions, there were, was quite some uh, working cabling involved here, as you can see, um, that in principle, I mean, if needed, we can switch to Ethernet here. Okay, so some throughput tests here. Um, on the diagram here, you see 84 senders times 50 uh, receiving PCs, so every sender sending data to every PC, so in total you have about 4,200 connections. Um, you see the leaf switches here, then the spine switches here, and then again the leaf switches, so this is unfolding the, the folded clone network, and the, uh, the width of the, the lines corresponds to or indicates the, is, or is indicative of the amount of data which is flowing through a certain link. So what was nice to see is actually that the routing tables um, are such that the, um, the three links are on this side from the leaf to the spine switches are nicely I mean, they're all utilized. What we first didn't understand is why when you go uh, back from the spine to the leaf switches, that is typically only few links which are used. But then, on the other hand, um, what we then understood is that, for example, when you have uh, that a number of links used uh, here actually always corresponds to the number of links used back to the leaf switches. So, in principle, uh, the capacity this should not be a bottleneck because you have the same capacity used here than here. Um, to run the benchmark, this is essentially, we use QPerf. The reason why we use QPerf is that if you have problems and we had some issues where the vendor helped us actually to, to solve them, we can always go and say, look, we run QPerf. It's not the bottleneck of our own application and so on. 
Um, the other reason is why we run this is that this gives us sort of an upper limit on, on what we can achieve with our home uh, built software. So the event builder software actually is not just QPerf because here you just stream event essentially from this place to this place. Um, our event builder obviously have to do the synchronization. There's some other protocol running, I mean, protocol we designed ourselves to make sure that uh, everybody sends the data for one collision to the same PC and so on, so this gives you some overhead. Um, so what we achieved is about 37 gigabits per second, is about 70% of line speed, and yesterday I was happy to see that this is actually a figure which other people also seem to be getting, although we are thinking of uh, if we can, of, of ways if we can try to improve this. So now a test with real with the real event builder software. So you see here as function of uh, the message size, um, the the throughput in megabytes here. So for different sizes of systems. So you see there is some a bit of a scaling effect here, um, but still the, the the dashed line here corresponds to the requirement that we should be able or that we have to be able to do this at the rate of 100 uh, kilohertz per second. So when you're above the curve, you're fine. So we see that for the message sizes which we are uh, thinking of, we should be in the, uh, yes, we should be in the green area here. So, um, again, just to compare, this is about 32 gigabits per receiving PC, so this is about 86% of the QPerf throughput, so this means it's about 14% uh, overhead from our application. Okay, so then uh, one word about the high-level trigger. Um, so after the assembly of the full collision data, or the second layer of PCs, so these are these PCs here typically, um, they're sent to what we call filter units. Um, so there is the, uh, the software running here. So the, the advantage of software, obviously, is you can take a student after three months or so, they can write some field algorithms. Uh, with the FPGAs, is typically one engineer or so who can do something there. Um, so the task here is to reduce the, the rate of about 100 kilohertz to about one kilohertz, which then goes to, uh, to offline storage. Um, you have about 15,000 calls. This means you have about 150 milliseconds decision time whether to accept or reject the data for a collision or not. Um, to give you an idea of the um, size of the project, I mean, this is not only filtering code, but it's the whole framework. It's the same as the offline software, which is then used later on for more detailed analysis. It's about 3.8 million lines of C++ code and 1.2 million lines of Python code. Um, what you do here is you do a partial reconstruction of collision data. So you saw before that we have these nice tracks and the, the, the classes of energy deposits for, so by eye it's very easy to do, but uh, for a computer it's more difficult, obviously. Um, for example, for the track fitting, essentially what you do is Kalman filtering and so on. So you have also to know which hit uh, belongs to the same track and which one doesn't and so on. So, And you also match um, the tracks you find here, so the curves to the regions of high energy deposit. Um, for this, version of the event builder, we actually try to follow a new approach. One problem we had in the old system was that um, the, the, the software frameworks of the diff two different projects were tightly coupled when you, you had to compile one against the other and so on. And this was always a bit tedious because you have different release cycles. So here we, uh, we tried a new approach, which is that once the, the full uh, data is assembled, it's written to file on the RAM disk and then exported to the other PCs via NFS. Um, this allows us to decouple the two frameworks essentially, but uh, what we underestimated obviously in the beginning was that uh, instead of tuning your software, you start to understand uh, the internals of NFS and maybe even um, what's happening in the kernel and so on. So. Okay, so conclusions. So we presented the new data acquisition system network, the event builder for the CMS detector at CERN for run two. Um, so we're using multiple network technologies, essentially we're using, yes, from one over 10 to 40 gigabit to 56 gigabit FDR, we're using essentially everything. We're ready for uh, data taking for run two, so unfortunately this was uh, delayed by about a week, uh, by about a month, as I heard this morning, uh, because there's a problem in the machine, and we're looking obviously forward to exploring new energies. Thank you.